but um, I'd really like to just if, touch on athletes and performance and protein and nutrition needs um, for athletes, if, if that's okay. Sure. Have, have a chat so about that. Athletes, yeah. So, so far we've been kind of talking about keeping adults healthy. And so we've been talking about how to get enough protein in an environment where the general calorie value is going down. They just can't handle as much calories as they get older. Now we switch to an athlete who has really high calorie demands and are probably trying to increase at the very least the strength of their muscles and maybe even the mass of their muscles. So now we go into how do we create an anabolic period. So for muscle building and, and athletes trying to grow and develop, we frequently argue that they should have four meals per day where they're getting at least the 30 grams of uh, protein, uh, up to three grams of leucine. Because we're trying, the, when you have a protein meal, the anabolic period only lasts about two hours. And so if we're having an anabolic meal and we're only doing that once a day, say at dinner, we only have one meal that reaches 30 grams, that means we're spending 22 hours a day in a catabolic period. That's aging. And so the reason we yeah. want more meals is we want more anabolic periods. And so the athlete is gonna try and maximize that. I know athletes who get up in the middle of the night and take a protein shake at three in the morning because they're trying to act, maximize those anabolic periods. And so you know, we would re recommend for an athlete trying to gain muscle that they try and have at least three and maybe four meals a day that hit those 30 gram thresholds, one of those probably right after their exercise period, and we would like to see them spaced at least four hours apart. Okay, so that's, that's quite a lot. That's a long feeding window and quite a lot of food. When I was, you know, studying nutrition way back, <laughs> over long ago, we were always taught that um, you needed, but within 20 minutes to two hour feeding window, and that it needed to have carbohydrates with your protein, um, you know, for the insulin to help uptake the amino acids. Is that still standard sort of? Yeah, thoughts? it really is true. So um, carbohydrate and protein. So, so the insulin effect for amino acid uptake, amino acids themselves generate enough insulin to take care of uptake. Baseline levels of insulin are totally adequate. So you don't need it for that purpose. The um, carbohydrate aspect relates to the type of exercise you're doing. So if you're doing, the higher the intensity, the more carbohydrates you need. So people who are doing just long distance running need a lot of energy, but they could get it from either fat or carbohydrates. People who are doing more intense exercise, for example, elite tennis players, they probably use quite a bit of carbohydrate because everything is sudden bursts of activity. And so, you know, you need to kind of th think about the carbohydrate and protein parts as different parts. They have different purposes, um, but that you don't need them together, really. Um, as far as the amount of protein, um, Generally, most of the exercise literature will say that endurance athletes should be in sort of the 1.2 to 1.6, and the strength building athletes should be more in the 1.4 to 1.8 range. But a lot of muscle building athletes will go up to 2.5 grams right. per kg. So again, one of the things, if you're trying to build muscle, you almost have to be in positive calorie balance. It's very difficult to be losing weight and building muscle. Can be done, but it really takes a unique training process. So most people who are trying to gain mass will also be eating quite a lot of food. And hence, you can have more protein. Right. So for an athlete, you know, I... Um... I'm thinking in particular at the moment about slalom, um, canoe slalom athletes. So they have sort of 90 second races, quite, mm -hmm. ex, you know, quite explosive. Yep. Um, 
And then they do quite a lot of training. They'll train a couple of times a day. They'll train in the gym. And then, so they want to build strength, build explosive power. Right. Uh, they also want to maintain body Sure. Body, body weight. So what kind of, you know, what kind of suggestions would you have for someone like that? So I'm not an expert in canoe racing, but my understanding is they probably also do heats where they'll do maybe more than one race in a day. Yes, correct. Uh, and so again, these are explosive races. So these are going to be very heavily glycogen oriented. So these are athletes who are definitely going to, they're going to want to develop the strength. So they need the protein in their training, but they're also going to be carbohydrate oriented because they have to have that explosive energy. And so sprinters, you know, the world-class sprinters, uh, they're very carbohydrate oriented too, because I mean, the, the world-class hundred meter sprinters basically don't breathe during the race. It's a nine second race and it's basically all on, on ATP, uh, creatine phosphate and glycogen. I mean, they basically don't breathe till they cross the finish line. <laughs> There's nothing aerobic about it. <laughs> and a 90 second canoe race, I mean, that's gonna be almost all done on glycogen. Right, so, so they're gonna really need to focus on their carbohydrate and their protein intakes. So. Yeah, I mean they're gonna they're gonna be working on their you know aerobic capacity, but really it's gonna be strength and explosive power is what they're gonna be looking for. And so you know they're an athlete like a tennis player who will be fairly carbohydrate oriented. Okay, and so then alternatively, um, you spoke about the endurance athletes. So the endurance athletes can um, use fatty acids for energy so what they're yeah so the training of an endurance athlete is to build up mitochondria to build up their red blood cells so that they can continuously deliver oxygen because as soon as you go into oxygen debt like in a canoe race you have to quit i mean the lactic acid will build up and those guys doing a 90 second race if you said well it's going to be a three it's going to be a 10 minute race this time they would simply die i mean they yeah. can't do it uh, but, you know, the, the endurance athletes are building up their mitochondria, the red blood cells, so they can deliver oxygen and they can sustain it. What we've seen now in the last 10 years or so is people like marathon runners or Tour de France, those guys now uh, take in carbohydrates. They will have these gels and things. So they will just sort of titrate in carbohydrates all the time so that they can kind of maintain that high level. There'll be, there's a crossover between fat use and carbohydrate use somewhere around 60% of VO2 max. So when you get to about that level, if you're less than that, so you're out walking or jogging, you're basically a fat user. You're using that as fuel. Carbohydrates are very low. Uh, you and I sitting here are probably using 80% fats and 20% carbohydrates max. Okay, if go out and start walking, that sort of starts coming together. Somewhere around, for an athlete, maybe 140 beats per minute heart rate, they'll get a crossover. And now it's mostly carbohydrates. And that it keeps going. And so an elite athlete is going to try and maintain, you know, a heart rate of a 180 beats per minute or higher, uh, and they'll be maintaining 85% VO2 max, and they're gonna do this for four hours. Uh, they will titrate in some carbohydrates as they do that, and that's kind of what they're training to do. But it's still mostly a fat, it's mostly fat energy that they're using. Right. Okay, but then that doesn't cross over to the general population, just for general population people yeah, who are listening. I mean, I mean a typical person, you know, uh, you know, for me, I'm, I'm a tennis player. My VO2 max, my 60% range is probably more around 120 beats per minute now, where an elite athlete might be 160 you know, a 20 year old elite athlete, because the older you get, the low, that number keeps going down. <laughs> yeah. 
So what about these um, athletes, you know, bodybuilders, powerlifters, um, crossfitters who are doing carnivore or, you know, really, really low carb diets? What do you, you know? I mean, so they're, they're looking at high protein and they're also trying to control calories and they're also trying to keep carbohydrates low. Carbohydrates, um, because of the glycogen things, will put on more water weight. And so athletes will lose the definition. Their muscles will look softer. And so if you're looking at bodybuilders or people looking for body sculpting, uh, basically they'll always be low carb because it takes the glycogen away and it takes a lot of the water weight away. Right, okay. And what about our muscle stores of glycogen? You know, we store, what What do we store like about 300 grams or something? Is that yeah, right? I always forget that number, but it's something like that, yeah. <laughs> and, and so that can only be used by the muscle, can't it? We can't take, extract that out and use well, it. Well, that's body. sort of, that's kind of a misnomer. Um, First thing about muscle glycogen, because of the branch stru structure, we only use about 50% of it during an activity because the branch, we can kind of use the chains. It's kind of like the branches of a tree and you can kind of use it down to the branch points. And after that, you can't use it very well. So if you're, if you're lost in the woods and starving for a week, you'll slowly use it. But if you're thinking about acute exercise, you can only use it down to the branch points. Same as in the liver. Overnight, we can use about 50% max of our glycogen stores just because of the branch points. Um, the use of glycogen, as it breaks down, the, the, the muscle can't release glucose directly into the blood. But what we do is we use the glucose down to a molecule known as pyruvate through glycolysis we get the ATP out of it. And when it gets there, we can then release it back into the blood as either alanine or lactic acid. It goes back to the liver and the liver can remake it into glucose, gluconeogenesis. And basically the evidence is that in an, in an exercise like a long distance bike race, um, about 40% of blood glucose is coming from recycled glycogen. Okay, but that would so be a, you can get like glucose process. from glycogen back into the blood, but it's through the rever the process of gluconeogenesis from pyruvate lactate and back. So that would be a fairly slow process, wouldn't it? It That's takes right. more than an hour before that really gets geared up. So okay. if you're talking about activities that are less than an hour, uh, basically you're just using glycogen at that point, and you'll actually accumulate the lactic acid. Right. And so, you know, high-end athletes will get muscle cramps because they've accumulated too much lactate and they can't get rid of it fast enough. Oh, excellent. Thank you very much for that.